I think around 3.30. So if you would please do that, that would help out a lot. One thing I have not mentioned yet, for those of you who um, are part of the symposium, a booklet will be sent to you uh, outlining some of the background material for what we've talked about today or what our speakers have talked about today. Another thing, uh, it's interesting what you can do with Zoom compared to what perhaps we've not been able to do before in that folks who are overseas can now watch on Zoom our symposium. And we do have a young man in Kosovo who is watching uh, either right now or has been with us prior to right now. Maybe he has hung in there and still with us now, I'm not sure. But he's in Kosovo as a missionary. Uh, Kosovo is located north of Greece and I believe west of um, Bulgaria, somewhere around in there in West or in Eastern Europe, he is, he is ministering. So that's kind of cool that someone that far away would take an interest in what our speakers have had to present today. But Dr. Tom Taylor from the esteemed Wittenberg University uh, is going to present to us Lincoln's Emancipation Gambit. Um, it's really interesting. He attends a church where Wittenberg College's first classes were, take, were held. So that's, per, that's really neat. Um, that's still in existence today at First Lutheran. But as I mentioned to you earlier before, Tom is um, the behind the scenes guy here with, this, uh, with our symposium and that I consulted with him in 2010 about the possibility of doing something like this. And I picked his big brain and he gave me some great ideas. And uh, as a result, this is what took place uh, starting in the, the 2011, I think we began, it was in May at that point in time. But we've since moved it to March and the next symposium for next year is on March the 4th. It's the first Saturday in March of 2023. So if you wanna put that on your calendar now, uh, the topic we'll announce at the end of the time today before we move on. But we want to thank Tom. He's a two-time uh, uh, president of our historical society here in at Clark County. He is, uh, there's a story that I have about Tom that's pretty neat. I'm a docent at our Heritage Center, our museum, uh, where we usually hold our symposium in person. And while I was in there on a Saturday afternoon, a young lady and her husband came through the museum and I was with them for a while and I asked her, uh, you know, where she came from and what she, you know, what's up. She told me that she uh, has been here three years now and she's a vice president at Wittenberg University in charge of, um, I wanna say development, but I'm not sure. But she's been here for three years. I said, oh, I know a couple of Wittenberg people. I said, you know, Dr. Tom Taylor and her eyes lit up and she smiled real big and said, of course I do. And uh, she went on to extol his virtues really well. And I was just wondering if it's the same Tom Taylor that I knew or no. But nonetheless, uh, he is highly regarded at the university and we are really thrilled. Now this is his second time with us. He presented a wonderful work on General George Joseph Warren Kiefer from Springfield, Ohio with the 110th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. And um, then it was in the Wilderness Campaign with Ulysses S. Grant. But today, he's going to talk about the emancipation. So, Tom, thank you for taking your time to be with us, and we look forward to uh, what you have to say today. Thank you, Dr. Shainer. From where I'm sitting, I can't tell if my PowerPoint is being shared or not. Uh, no, Tom, you'll need to share on your side if you can bring it up. Or I, I mean, I can bring it up, but you'll have to ask me to advance your slide. Yeah, and I thought I was, but it doesn't seem to be working at my side. Okay. I can bring it up on my side if you want. That but might then be I'll, best. Then I'll have to control it. You'll have That's to let okay. me know. You're okay. controlling everything else. That's okay. <laughs> All right, let me. I did want to say up front while Natalie's doing that, uh, first, thanks to all the planners, the Heritage Center staff, um, and as always uh, to Dr. Shainer. Uh, those of you from out of town may not realize that Ski Shainer is actually a dentist. He's a rather beloved figure in town, and I don't know how often you put the word beloved with a dentist in the same sentence, but uh, he is one. 
I also wanted to say to all of those of you, I know there's a contingent of regulars at the symposium who come here at least in part for the for the donuts from Schuler's. And uh, we're deeply uh, bothered that you don't get your donuts this year. Uh, I do want you to know that some of us are going to Schuler's to eat donuts on your behalf and we're honored to do so. All right, Eric, my mouse went out. I had to, let me. Are we there? Just one second to get back over. There we go. Hmm. Can you see them? I see it, thank you. Okay. Uh, I've called the, the topic, of course, is, is uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. I've called it Lincoln's Emancipation Gambit because I, I want to approach this from, from a particular angle. The story itself is quite familiar. Uh, any of the panelists on today's program could uh, tell this story and probably tell it better than I. Uh, uh, it's, uh, but I do think it's often in the general public misunderstood. So I, I want to try to uh, explore that a bit. Okay. Um, when we get into the first slides, you'll see what I want to do here is look at um, uh, first the context of the proclamation, by which I mean late 1850s, 1860s, 61. Uh, and then in the second section, we'll be focused on the proclamation itself and various issues there. And the third section, we'll look briefly at, uh, at consequences. And if there's overlap between this and some other sessions today, I think that's inevitable given the topics. Uh, I found the other sessions really, really helpful. So I hope that this will add to that. Um, it, there had been in the 1830s and 40s, a bit of a political consensus in the country that uh, whatever happened to slavery, it was understood that the, the slavery was in the Southern tier of the country and, and not in the northern tier of the country. And that really begun during the revolutionary period. Uh, there have been major fights, of course, uh, the biggest one probably the Missouri Compromise fight in the 1819, 1820. But generally that was the pattern. That is the country expanded westward, uh, northern territories became free states, southern territories might be open to slavery. And that was accepted to a large degree by a wide range of, of political, from a wide range of political viewpoints. Um, but that began to break down in the 1840s and 50s. It broke down uh, uh, pretty completely, uh, in part because of the acquisition of the Mexican ter the territories from the Mexican War, in part because uh, different political groups started advocating for different positions. Uh, anti-slavery groups were less willing to uh, uh, continue that way. Uh, uh, you had some groups in the Democratic Party who didn't want Congress to decide at all. They wanted you know, local territories just to decide for themselves, thinking that would take the issue off the national stage. Uh, and then in the 1850s, uh, after the, especially after the dispute over Kansas territory and the Kansas-Nebraska Act, you began to see the different political factions really taking, staking out turf that just didn't lend itself to any kind of compromise or consensus. And maybe it was simply that that sense of consensus had played itself out. It could only last so long. Um, a way I want to look at that here is by looking at the uh, portions of the platforms from the 1860 election. And the first one we'll look at is the a Republican Party platform from 1860. And uh, you'll have text here that you know shows uh, that uh, uh, shows you what I mean. Um, the Republicans, of course, as a party, didn't exist until after 1854, and their first presidential election was 1856, in which they did rather well, well enough to alarm uh, Southern Democrats in particular. And then by 1860, of course, they turns out they were uh, uh, they had a they had major potential for winning the election. What, what I want to call your attention to here is the way they understand the territories uh, and the role of slavery in the territory. So if you look at number four, I'll read some of this to you. Um, uh, basically, they're saying, yeah, we recognize that states have the right to, as they put it, 
uh, control their own domestic institutions according to its own judgment exclusively. And that that's basic to the balance of powers on which the perfection and endurance of the our political fabric depends. Okay. But then in number seven, they say, here, they denounce what they say that that the new dogma that the Constitution of its own force carries slavery into any or all of the territories of the US is a dangerous political heresy at variance with the explicit provisions of that instrument itself. And here they're responding to Southern Democrats and the Supreme Court uh, who had taken the position now that slavery should be opened in all the Western territories. Then they say in number eight, the normal condition of all the territory of the US is that of freedom. And I won't read the whole thing to you, but you can see toward the bottom where they say to maintain this provision of, uh, of the constitution against all attempts to violate it, we deny the authority of Congress of a territorial legislature or of any individuals to give legal existence to slavery in any territory of the United States. And that position was widely regarded in the South and indeed by a number of Northerners uh, uh, as an extreme position. It wasn't the position of the former Whig party, uh, which had been more, I wanna say circumspect, that it may not be fair. The point is that the Republicans, um, partly in response to what Southern Democrats are saying, are staking out a position that doesn't quite fit that Missouri compromise consensus of the 1820s and 30s. Um, that's important for somebody like Lincoln. Lincoln grew up with that consensus. One of the architects of that consensus uh, was Henry Clay, Lincoln's political hero. So Lincoln was well aware of what that consensus had been, but he's also quite aware of uh, how the new Republican Party is, is departing from it. Now, they're not departing as much as somebody else, as you'll see quickly here. So let's go to the next one. The Democrats, of course, managed to lose the election of 1860 because they couldn't get along with each other. They split into, into two parties, uh, which is what made it possible for the smaller Republicans to win the Electoral College. Note, note what the Northern Democrats say about slavery in the territories. Inasmuch as differences of opinion exist in the Democratic Party as to the nature and extent of the powers of a territorial legislature and as to the powers and duties of Congress under the Constitution of the U.S. over the institution of slavery, resolved that the Democratic Party will abide by the decisions of the Supreme Court of the U.S. on the questions of constitutional law. In other words, they don't take a position or rather they say, we will accept what the Supreme Court has done. Now, what the Supreme Court had done at that point was to suggest that, that slavery could, could constitutionally at least appear in any Western territory. They didn't really think that would happen uh, for climate reasons, et cetera, but at least legally that was their position. Now, if we go on to the Southern Democrats, you'll see where, where the problem is really acute. The Southern Democrats claim it's the duty of the federal government to protect rights of persons and property in the territories and wherever else. And they go on to say that when the settlers in a territory okay, form a state constitution, the right of sovereignty commences and being consummated by an admission into the union, they stand on an equal footing with the people of other states and that a state thus organized ought to be admitted into the federal union whether its constitution prohibits or recognizes the institution of slavery. Now, what I'm trying to paint a picture of here and, and doing so rather quickly, of course, um, is that when it comes to slavery in the territories, uh, you don't have positions that are easily reconciled. The best the Northern Democrats could do was simply say, well, we'll accept what the court tells us. Uh, but the Southern Democrat position and the Republican Party position are both pretty clear and they're pretty much antithetical to one another. Um, um, and part of my point here simply is that that's a situation Lincoln inherits when he becomes president. Now, if we we'll go on, if we fast forward a little bit, Lincoln, of course, won the election. He did so by winning uh, almost all the electoral votes in the free states. 
He, he won, of course, with only like 39 and a half percent of the popular vote, which our constitution, of course, our system allows to happen. Once he was elected, however, because the Republicans are perceived in the South as a threat to slavery in a way that the Whigs never had been, Southern states start seceding. Well, uh, in the next slide, you'll see that in most of those secession ordinances, as they're called, there's no explicit mention of slavery. Some people take that to suggest that slavery isn't an issue. Some people even seriously try to claim that secession wasn't about slavery. But it's very clear from some of those resolutions, and, and I think equally clear from the overall context, that without slavery, you don't get secession in the first place. And some of this, even these first seven ordinances are quite explicit. Um, if you uh, will take the Texas one here that's in front of us, whereas the recent developments in federal affairs make it evident that the power of the federal government sought to be made a weapon with which to strike down the interests and property of the people of Texas and her sister slaveholding states, instead of permitting it to be as was intended, our shield against outrage and aggression, therefore, and then they go on to declare independence. So the point I'm making simply here is that in the, the first seven secessions, which occurred between December 1861 and February 1862, um, after Lincoln's election, but before he even arrived in Washington, uh, it's pretty darn clear that the motivating force uh, is is worries in these seven states that the Republicans are some somehow constitute a threat to slavery eventually, uh, if if not immediately, and the folks who try to claim that slavery isn't the motivating cause here, I, it seems to me have a lot to explain. The texts and there are a lot more texts here would explain would suggest otherwise. All right, now moving on. Of course, once Lincoln did get to. D.C. and gave his uh, first inaugural address in March. Uh, within a few weeks of that, the Fort Sumter crisis occurred. And after the, the, uh, the firing on Fort Sumter, uh, Lincoln called for uh, troops. Now, Lincoln himself uh, had, you know, it was no threat to slavery in the South when he was elected. It, his election, it, I think if we're trying to understand Southern sentiment, it's, it's that it signaled, signaled what I call here a significant turn in the balance of power. Uh, public opinion was shifting, and the southern states simply weren't going to have the kind of control in, in Washington that they'd enjoyed in the past. Um, it's not simply that he didn't have a plan against, he didn't have a realistic plan for, for achieving emancipation, even if he'd wanted to. I mean, it wasn't clear to people how you would go about emancipation. Uh, emancipating 4 million people, uh, and would it be with compensation? There were people who said, oh, you can free the slaves and then send them, well, they would say back to Africa, which was ludicrous because these slaves were born in America. Back to Africa made no sense. So Lincoln had no plan, and it's not even clear what a plan would have looked like if there'd been one. When the, the fighting began, to be sure, the immediate issue was leaving the Union. It was, in that sense, a war for Southern independence. Uh, but as I've said, clearly, their primary motivation was protecting slavery. The irony for me is, if what they were worried about was slavery in the territories, it's hard to see how seceding was going to help that situation. Uh, all right, we better move on here. Think about how difficult the situation is for Lincoln and uh, what kind of disappointments he faced early on. Uh, he was elected in late fall, 61. By the time he even arrived in Washington, he had lost seven states. He uh, certainly did not want to start war. Uh, uh, Secretary Seward, who was handling things in DC on Lincoln's behalf before Lincoln arrived, worked very hard to reassure people that they were not going to be a threat to the Southern states. There ought to be some way to work something out, et cetera, et cetera. But with the Fort Sumter crisis, of course, they had war anyway. Uh, and once Lincoln called for troops to put down the rebellion in the South, the Union lost four more states, right? 
So the point I'm making here simply is that Lincoln's early weeks in office did not bode well. I mean, it's hard to imagine a president who had a worse set of circumstances. Um, and he learned very early on that what you expect to occur and what actually occurs can be two very different things. And that all decisions have consequences and it's the ones that are hard to predict that can, uh, that can do the most harm in the long run. So as Lincoln gets acclimated to the jobs, making decisions, dealing with Congress, let, uh, Natalie, let's go back one. Um, I think we need to keep in mind that Lincoln has several concerns here he has to keep in, in his head all of the time. By the summer, he has 11 slave states who declare themselves to be the Confederacy, but that means there are four border states left in the Union. And those border states, if they chose to secede, would end up, among other things, surrounding the District of Columbia, but they'd also change the population balance between the USA and the CSA. The, the presence of the border states, the problems of the border states are a constant problem for Lincoln. And, and folks who criticize Lincoln for not being uh, more direct or more radical than he was uh, quite easily uh, uh, skip that important fact. The second problem is that if now that, now that you're in a war, Lincoln needs Northern Democrats to support the effort. Uh, there were plenty of Northern Democrats who did not, some of them quite famously, but Lincoln doesn't want to alienate Northern Democrats unnecessarily. He knows they disagree with him on a number of points, but many of them, of course, do support uh, saving the Union. Many of them do support the war effort in that regard. So he has to be careful that he doesn't alienate them. Thirdly, um, it, it, Pursuing some kind of emancipation program at the beginning of the war could very easily enrage Southern whites that might be amenable to some kind of a resolution. Uh, I, I think in the 21st century, there's a, it's certainly in the general pu public, we tend to uh, uh, overgeneralize these groups. And uh, uh, we assume white Southerners think this way and white Northerners think that way and black citizens think that way. Um, in fact, the white sentiment was pretty complex. Lincoln knew Southerners. He had Southern relatives. He had lots of Southern friends. He understood that the, that the region like the rest of the country could be quite complicated. And he, he was quite worried about um, pushing some of them farther than he needed to. Similarly, he's worried that um, he doesn't want to do something that will trigger violence in the South, either white on black violence or black on white violence. And, and that was a concern that a number of people expressed. We look back and think it was unfounded because there was so little of it over the next number of years that is black on white violence. Um, but, at, but at the time, they simply didn't know that. Another problem he has is that Southerners, of course, were claiming that the Republicans were out to get rid of slavery. Uh, and uh, that was their justification for seceding. Well, if Lincoln moves against slavery early on, he's only going to reinforce that claim. So, as I say here, in short, the situation is very precarious. Uh, he has to balance all of these interests in a way really nobody else had to balance them. All right, Natalie, next one. Um, that doesn't mean nothing happened. In 1861, uh, you, you see some Union commanders freeing slaves uh, when uh, they would move into an area and it was obvious that slaves were being used in ways that were helping the rebellion itself. Uh, and they were allowed to uh, f free those slaves uh, by the government in Washington. And then in late summer of 1861, Congress passed the first Confiscation Act, which uh, a allowed for the freeing of slaves that were being used to support the Confederate military. Uh, a lot of black men were used in ways that helped the Confederate army. They weren't armed and they weren't fighting, but they were used in ways to support that army. Um, so that, that confiscation act began a process of some slaves being freed, or at least the possibility of such. Even that act Lincoln was concerned about. Uh, he almost didn't sign it because he wasn't sure it was constitutional. Uh, this is one of his major worries uh, in these early years. What's legal for him to do? What is not? 
from his point of view, the whole war is about protecting the Constitution and about protecting the, the Republic under this Constitution. And so he didn't want to violate the Constitution. He did not want to abuse his own authority uh, uh, in the name of trying to defend the Constitution. It wasn't that he wasn't willing to do so, but he didn't want to do so unnecessarily. Uh, there was a second confiscation bill, which was introduced in late 61, which would have been much broader and might have moved the cause of, uh, of emancipation along. And it did re receive support in the House, but in the Senate, the debate went on and on and on for months. Uh, and so uh, uh, that did not make a, a much progress there for the you know, first half of 1862. In that same period, Lincoln openly suggested, what about emancipation where we compensate the owners? Um, to some people, that was the logical thing to do. Uh, pay off the owners so uh, they don't have the economic loss. Uh, the problem is in the in the border states, he couldn't find much buy-in for that proposal. All right, by the summer of '62, uh, Lincoln's still worried about his the limits on his powers. Uh, but the war has now dragged on for a year. You've seen the you know the terrible fighting at Shiloh. You saw. The peninsula in, that is in April of 1862, the peninsula campaign in the east in 1862 and going into the summer. Uh, it's pretty clear to Lincoln and others that the war is, there's no way this war will be won quickly. It's going to drag on and it may well be necessary to use emancipation as a war tool, as a way to uh, break down uh, 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 the South's ability to fight the war. So Lincoln made that decision in the summer of 62, but of course he had to delay it because another concern he had was if you make such an announcement when you're, when you're losing battles, you just look desperate. Uh, and that could actually backfire on him. Uh, which leads us to a really famous exchange that uh, is probably familiar to you. In the next slide, you'll see, uh, in, in, in the next few slides, you'll see some of the text of this exchange. Uh, Horace Greeley, of course, was a northern newspaper editor who was criticizing Lincoln, as were a number of people in, in mid-1862, for not seizing on the confiscation acts and pressing them uh, forcefully, getting as much advantage out of them as they could. Now, Lincoln had his reasons for not being as quick on that point. But nonetheless, they were criticizing him in public. And Greeley's one of those. And Greeley was sympathetic in a lot of ways, but thought Lincoln could do more and could do it faster. Um, he, and he published an editorial saying so. So Lincoln responded with an editorial in, a, in another uh, newspaper in New York with this very, very famous passage that I want to read to you because it's just, it, it, at this point, Lincoln knew he was going to pursue emancipation, but he couldn't say it yet. Nonetheless, the letter explains his thinking and explains it in classic Lincoln ways. All right. As to the policy I seem to be pursuing, as you say, I have, met, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. I would save the union. I would save it in the shortest way under the Constitution. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the union will be the union as it was. If there be those who would not save the union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. If there be those who would not save the union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. Lincoln was a master at using parallel structures. And of course he was a, he was a terrific phrase maker. Okay, he goes on in the next slide to say, my paramount objective in this struggle is to save the union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the union. 
I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause, and I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors, and I shall adopt new views so fast as they shall appear to be true views. I've here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. As I say, I think this is classic Lincoln prose. Um, it's effective. Again, he uses parallel structures. He repeats phrases and words, and his meaning is crystal clear, even if it's not precisely what Horace Greeley wanted to hear uh, that month. Okay, to move the story along here. Lincoln told his cabinet that he wanted to pursue him, that he was going to pursue emancipation. And so over the next several weeks, the big issue was what would the technical issues be and, and, and what would the timing be of such an announcement? After the Battle of Antietam, which, um, which stopped Lee's invasion of Northern Free Territory in September, uh, Lincoln concluded this was as good of, of a victory as they were going to get and that provided an adequate opportunity for making the announcement. So as you see here in this uh, September 22nd uh, preliminary proclamation, they make it clear that their person, their intention is on the first day of January that persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the U.S., shall be then thenceforward, thenceforward and forever free, and the government would enforce this. So it, it's Lincoln saying very clearly, and yes, this will frustrate some people, where people are still in rebellion, their slavery will end as of January 1. In theory, this slave states could stay between before January 1, okay, we'll drop the rebellion and they could keep their slaves. In theory, that could happen. Uh, Lincoln was open to that. Of course, that did not happen. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the document, the Emancipation Proclamation, you just saw one passage. I think you'll agree with me, it's not terribly interesting. Uh, it certainly isn't the Gettysburg Address or the first or second inaugural. It's not even like the letter to Greeley. Um, Lincoln is capable of, of rhetorical heights, as I think we all know, but he's also a lawyer. And uh, people who are disappointed by the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, I certainly understand their disappointment. Um, but I think what's going on here, this is Lincoln the lawyer, and Lincoln the lawyer balancing uh, what he believes needs to be done for the war effort with what he also believes to be limits on his constitutional authority. And he truly does not wish to uh, violate the latter. So in the Emancipation Proclamation, we don't get so much of Lincoln's rhetoric. What we get is Lincoln's uh, legal thinking. Uh, and I think once we accept that, we understand why the document had to be written the way it was uh, and why it, it uh, doesn't reach to uh, grander heights than it might have done. In the next slide, you'll see uh, some of what was added by the time it came out officially in January 1. The original document laid out a general plan, but the, the formal proclamation in January added some provisions, and these are very important. You'll notice that he added here, he felt the need to do this, I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence unless in necessary self-defense. And I recommend to them that in all cases when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. Now, a number of folks would say that really wasn't necessary. He didn't need to do that. It's almost insulting. Uh, but he was worried about violence um, and he was worried about violence either direction, white on black or black on white. Uh, and if nothing else, at least he could say to critics, that uh, I, I did call for uh, you know peaceful transition and I called on these folks to uh, become free and then labor, labor faithfully, as he said, for reasonable wages. Uh, another section that was added 
which you might think is a little inconsistent with the previous. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and demand vessels of all sorts in said service. Of course, this is the authorization for bringing African American men into military service and in service in such fashion that they will end up fighting. Uh, it's a major change in, in government policy. It's also one of the reasons um, that uh, Southerners were so angry over the announcement. Uh, because on the one hand, he's calling on uh, freed slaves uh, to avoid violence. But on the other hand, he's saying, but you can also join the army and the Navy, in which, of course, there was going to be violence. Uh, I don't know how he could have gotten around that problem. It's just a, it's a tension that it seems to be inherent in the situation. But but providing for uh, allowing former slaves and, and African American men in general, free blacks as well as former slaves, to serve in the military has enormous consequences. A very important provision of the document. It sometimes gets lost in the rhetoric about emancipation itself. Okay, in the next slide. He also added this section. He was under, he had a lot of people visit him in late 62, a lot of ministers, especially, saying, gee, we read your document in September and it's kind of dull. And uh, we think this is a moral crusade. And you might want to say something about that. So this sentence was added um, in which he says, uh, two things really that are very important. He said, number one, he believes it to be an act of justice warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity. He thinks it's the just thing to do. He thinks the Constitution allows it and that he's acting within his authority. And he also adds a religious note uh, inviting the uh, judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. Again, this is in response in part to the various people who'd been visiting him uh, uh, in late 1862, encouraging him to say something like that. Some of those visits were almost comical. Um, one Quaker lady visited him, and he referred to her as the friend, and, and told him once, once they met that uh, God had sent her there to tell him to free the slaves. And Lincoln responded that it seemed odd to him that God would tell her and not tell him that that was his intention. Uh, another pastor came and, and after a meeting stuck his head back in and told Mr. Lincoln, uh, by the way, I, God sent me here to tell you to free the slaves, right? And Lincoln's response to that was, uh, well, it seems kind of odd that if he wanted to deliver that message to me, he would deliver that message by way of that den of iniquity, the city of Chicago. The guy was from Chicago. So Lincoln still had a sense of humor, but he was also a little irritated at these folks telling him what God wanted, uh, when, as he put it himself, he thought about this issue every day. It was on his mind all the time. How do I do this? How do I do it properly? How do I do the right thing for the country? But how do I avoid exceeding my authority? I think for me, one of the most moving things about all this with Lincoln was how seriously he struggled with it how he's trying to balance all these different forces around him and still trying to do the right thing. And for him, it's not an easy decision because he recognized the complexity of the situation. Okay, moving on. We start seeing people react, of course, once the announcement's made in January 163, uh, lots of folks respond. Some of these I really like. Frederick Douglass, arguably the greatest uh, abolitionist orator and writer uh, of the era, certainly one of them, said, we are all liberated by this proclamation. Everybody is liberated. The white man is liberated. The black man is liberated. The bravest men now fighting the battles of their country against rebels and traitors are now liberated. I congratulate you upon this amazing change, the amazing approximation toward the sacred truth of human liberty, which is a great Douglas phrase. Um, other reactions, of course, the reactions were all over the board. Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, 
said, our own detestation of those who have attempted the most execrable measure recorded in the history of guilty man is tempered by profound contempt for the impotent rage which it discloses. Uh, both these sentiments were common in Southern reactions, Southern government reactions. On the one hand, they had seen this war as a war um, over their way of life, but for independence and a war being fought to some degree, at least honorably by men on both, by white men on both sides, but using the war to free slaves and then using slaves to fight against their former owners and masters, um, many Southern whites found that to be beneath contempt. And they also suggested that Lincoln was just desperate. Um, I think Lincoln wasn't desperate at that point, but you can see why they would describe it that way. Uh, the next reaction from the New York world said it more briefly, succinctly, he has proclaimed emancipation only where he notoriously has no power to enforce it, which was, which was quite true. Uh, slaves will be freed in areas still in rebellion, uh, but it would not be until those areas had been conquered by Union forces that that uh, would mean anything. The next one from the governor of Massachusetts says it's a poor document, but a mighty act. And that's a common theme. Some folks who were disappointed in the document nonetheless said, maybe that doesn't matter very much. Maybe what matters most is the act itself. Uh, let's see the next one. Lincoln said, the time for its effect southward has not come. It would not affect the Southern states anytime soon, but northward the effect should be instantaneous. Indeed, it practically was. It united the Republicans in a way they'd not been united in the previous year. Um, <clears throat> it, it, caused, it caused some ruffles in the Democratic Party to be sure, but it certainly united the Republicans. Next slide. Shelby Foote, who many of you will remember from the, the uh, Ken Burns Civil War series wrote, most people did not read it critically. They took it for more than it was, or more than what it said. He would go down to posterity, not primarily as the preserver of the Republic, which he was, but as the great emancipator, which he was not. Thank you. <clears throat> the Burlington Weekly Hawkeye, okay, don't worry about who they are, um, said, we care not how the Emancipation Proclamation of President Lincoln may be in the present times considered, whether emanating merely as a war measure or, or as an abolition of conscientious regard for the cause of humanity. Yet coming ages and other nations will hail it as an evidence of the philanthropy and goodness of Abraham Lincoln whose name will be enrolled high on the scroll of fame side by side with the names of those other noble men whose deeds of benevolence and the disinterested love of the races of humanity have been sung with gladness for centuries. I find this highly prophetic that it, that argue about what it was about originally, but in the long run, it's going to be seen as evidence of Lincoln's own goodness and philanthropy. Uh, let's see in the next slide. <clears throat> this is one from Ohio, of course, uh, and it sums up the attitude of a lot of people. This was right before it took effect. One week remains until the rebels will have sinned away the day of grace allotted to them by the president. And when the proclamation will, we trust, go into effect. In other words, yeah, they gave him, he gave them some time to change their minds, but they didn't. Uh, and I love that phrase, send away the day of grace. And the next one, this is from Alabama. There may be some who imagine that important results are likely to flow from this Emancipation Proclamation, but we have no doubt they will live to acknowledge their disappointment. Of course, uh, the weekly advertiser proved wrong in the long run. Next slide. Now, just as important as what happened in America, maybe not just as important, but very important at the time, is what happened in Great Britain. Great Britain had uh, recognized both sides as belligerents under international law. 
But Great Britain had not recognized the Confederacy as a sovereign nation, which is what the Confederacy wanted. Uh, some Confederate leaders had expected that they would. Others, like Robert E. Lee, never thought Britain would recognize them. But the, the key point here is that once Lincoln made this a war against slavery, and that was official, it was politically impossible for people in the, in the higher levels of the British government to seriously contemplate any kind of British support for the Confederate cause. British public opinion simply swung too strongly in favor of the Union. Uh, working groups, uh, labor groups, uh, even if they were tied to the textile industry, which was tied to Southern cotton production, nonetheless did not like the idea of slavery and they did not want Great Britain siding with the, with the government that was uh, explicitly trying to protect slavery. Um, so the, the, they, were, they weren't close to recognizing the Confederacy, but they had been close to proposing a kind of uh, reconciliation process that they might mediate something Lincoln did not want them to do. But after Antietam and then after the Emancipation Proclamation, there simply is no chance. In other words, on the international stage, in a very crucial way, the Emancipation Proclamation was crucial for Lincoln's plans. It kept Great Britain from getting more involved uh, than they had been. OK, next slide. Lincoln's, um, there had been people saying to Lincoln from the beginning, look, black men want to fight in this war. They have a special reason to fight that others don't have. And uh, Lincoln had demurred. He, his, some of his commanders agreed, many of his commanders did not agree. Uh, the prejudice against black soldiers as combat soldiers was quite widespread in the early stages of the war. Um, Lincoln's proclamation changed the situation dramatically. Uh, this slide says 179,000. Earlier in the day, you heard 200,000 black troops. We don't know precisely how many African Americans ended up in the army and the Navy. Uh, it was somewhere in that range, 175,000, 200,000 or over. Um, so it's in the hundreds of thousands. Understand that um, volunteering for the Union Army didn't go all that well. Uh, and, and it was the, the even Congress had to resort to a draft in 1863. So being able to boost participation in the Union military uh, was, was actually played a very important role in creating the combination of factors that would make it possible uh, for Grant to put together a, a series of campaigns in 1864 that eventually would uh, lead to Union victory. So it, this is a way of saying that, that while uh, black troops might have been say 10% of the Union Army, augmenting the Union Army by a 10th or more plays a very significant role in 1864. There are folks who argue that it may well have won the war for the Union. Certainly it's a, it's a, a, a major factor uh, and there, the war records of those fighting units were very, very fine indeed. Now, the, the proclamation obviously didn't free everybody. And there were worries that even the slaves that had been freed might not stay free. Uh, if this was only a war measure, did it really apply after the war was over? So uh, conversations began pretty seriously about a constitutional amendment that would sew this up. So the Emancipation Proclamation isn't the end all and be all, but it does lead directly to the work on the constitutional amendment that we know is the 13th Amendment. Um, uh, there were fights in the Congress and uh, they could not get it completely approved very quickly, but eventually that is what would happen. Uh, by January, 1865, the amendment had been approved in both houses of the Congress. You can see the story uh, uh, reported in the Steven Spielberg movie, Lincoln. Uh, it's not very accurate. Uh, and a historian visiting our campus a few years ago was asked about that movie. 
And he said, no, he didn't think it was uh, historically reliable at all. And when he was asked to recommend another Lincoln movie, he suggested uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer as preferable. Uh, okay, so that was somewhat tongue in cheek, but you get the idea. Nonetheless, if you want to get a feel for some of the drama, uh, uh, watching Lincoln will certainly give you an idea of what was at stake, uh, even if it's not entirely fair to all the participants. And of course, it was ratified in the end of 1865. Another consequence of all this, of course, is that 4 million slaves were freed, ultimately, between the proclamation, the Union armies, and the 13th Amendment. Um, that constituted a huge loss to their owners. Uh, by that point, uh, folks weren't very sympathetic to that proposition. But anytime you uh, relieve individuals of $4 billion in assets, uh, it's going to have economic repercussions, and indeed it would for many years. Now, in in an economist, from an economist's point of view, um, the value of the labor of the slaves was transferred. It wasn't lost. It was simply transferred from the owners to the actual workers themselves, right? But nonetheless, the planter cl class lost a great deal of wealth. Uh, and that's, as I say, will have implications down the line. Next slide, Natalie, as we're very close to finishing here. As I put these things together, I think I would say there's three crucial consequences of the proclamation. Um, one is was was put well by Alan Nevins, a you know great scholar of the Civil War era, uh, who described that who said basically this took the war and turned it into a revolution. Ending slavery would transform the South in all kinds of ways. Even as disappointed as we are in the final results of Reconstruction by the 1880s and 1890s, nonetheless, the freedom of African Americans to form their own families, form their own churches, form their own eventually middle class, professional organizations, etc., uh, will, will unquestionably create a revolution in Southern and eventually national life. So the, the implications of this, that, that burst of freedom uh, and, uh, are, I, I, are still with us today. Uh, secondly, the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation basically was an international relations coup. Lincoln successfully fended off uh, any likelihood of British involvement, which meant the task was in the hands of the Union Army and the Union Navy and the government and Europeans would stay out of it. And then lastly, it changed the military manpower equation uh, at the very time in the war when military manpower was really becoming a serious issue. So when you put all these together, the proclamation um, was enormously consequential. Did it do everything we want? No. I wanna close this with a story that I love. As you probably know, Lincoln visited Richmond in 1864 after Richmond fell and he visited about a week before Lincoln himself was murdered. And he walked through the streets of, of Richmond, went to the Confederate Capitol building, sat behind Jefferson Davis's desk, et cetera. And uh, swarms of uh, freed African-Americans gathered around him, uh, calling him Father Abraham, et cetera. And for folks who say, well, the proclamation didn't go that far, it didn't do that much, you couldn't convince those people that he was not indeed the great emancipator. One of the stories I love most was when some came up to him and literally knelt down before him in the dirt. And uh, Lincoln said to them, don't kneel to me, that is not right. You must kneel to God only and thank him for the liberty you will hereafter enjoy. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. Arski, I just accidentally muted you. I have to unmute again. Okay, I have a question, maybe a couple, but the biggest one I have, oftentimes in studying the Civil War, people look for turning points. Um, I was within a conference once where someone made an effort to make um, Battle of Fort Donelson and Fort Henry turning points of the Civil War. 
an argument for Antietam to be a turning point, an argument for Gettysburg to be a turning point. Would you consider Antietam and its resultant preliminary and final Emancipation Proclamation to be the turning point of the American Civil War? Um, I'm, I'm somewhat agnostic on turning points, partly because uh, as you probably, as a lot of you will recall, James McPherson argued back in his great Pulitzer Prize winning history, at the very end of the book, after like 850 some odd pages, <laughs> he's, he made the point that, you know, when we talk about turning points, we forget that in military history, we forget the problem of contingency, that there were a number of days or number of months or weeks in the war when things could have gone differently. And absolutely one of them is that, is that fall of 1862. He said fall of 1862, but he also said uh, summer of 63, 18, he, actually, he actually had four of those. Um, there are moments when history might turn or might not turn. So the fact that Lee and the, the uh, Army of Northern Virginia was unsuccessful is, is undoubtedly crucial. Um, whether they ever would have won, you know, we can't know. And then Lincoln turning the, the war into a war over slavery to end slavery seems to me in some ways even more crucial. So if there's one moment, uh, if, if you buy the theory that 1864 was mostly about marshalling all the resources in order to win a war of attrition, then black soldiers were crucial in that effort and black soldiers come out of the Emancipation Proclamation. So you could argue, yes, that it's a, that it's a turning point. So you don't believe in definitive turning points? I don't have that much confidence in historians. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because you never, it, I mean, for me, part of what Lincoln learned in 1861 is uh, you, you can never fully predict what the consequences of actions will be. And so uh, at any given moment, I hesitate to say, well, it couldn't, at the, after that day, it couldn't have gone differently. That's what a turning point says. Um, and so if Gettysburg was the turning point, then what in God's name were they doing the next two years, right? Um, but it's, you can argue, I think, that it gets increasingly unlikely that the Confederates could pull off a victory. Uh, and that uh, becoming unlikely, certainly, it may be around, it may be around Antietam. Okay, this is almost a blasphemous question, and I hate to even pose it, but here it goes anyway. Um, do you think that President Lincoln was uh, so intent on introducing his Emancipation Proclamation uh, that he looked for an excuse to introduce it, knowing that he had to introduce it on a victory. And so he picked a Antietam and he called that a victory because the Confederacy left the field first, perhaps. Um, do you think he used that as an excuse because he really was intent on getting it out there? Um, I think, in claiming Antietam as, a, as some kind of great victory and therefore a good moment for the announcement, he was probably stretching it. I don't think it was because he was so determined to do it. Mm. Uh, what strikes me about Lincoln is that he was so doing this, um, but he also knew that he had, if, if he's going to do it, he's got to do it at some point, you know, he can't, right. uh, and, and, in certain portions of the war, if you're thinking to yourself, well, we'll wait till the Union wins a big battle, that might be a long wait. Uh, so uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm taking your question and, and tearing it into, into two different questions. All right. You're the historian. I'm just a hobbyist. That's all. No, I'm the equivocator. That's what I am. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll turn this back to Natalie and have her... Uh, bring in some more questions for you from the attendees. Sure thing. Thank you so much, Tom, for, for being with us. Uh, it is always good to hear you wax eloquently and see your face on the screen. So it's all good. Thank you. All right. Well, Tom, I think you actually answered um, 
one of the two of the questions that are up here right now, I think are safe for the better safe for the end panel, even if you could answer them right now. Um, but the other one um, was was asking if keeping Britain and Europe out of the war is really what pushed Lincoln into the declaration. And I think you touched a little bit on that at the end, that that was one of the big things that came out of it was keeping uh, them out of it, out of the war. Uh, I I think it's it's certainly one of the big it's a it's a significant factor in his thinking, but I don't think it's a single I don't think it's the driving factor. I don't think it's the most important factor. Um, I, what I guess one of the things I'd say about Lincoln is, I mean, when when folks watch politicians and leaders make decisions, the rest of us tend to reduce those decisions to simple do this or do that black and white decisions, either or right. And and I think Lincoln tended to do that in his first year in office. Lincoln had this amazing capacity for adapting, for learning from the situation. I, and I sincerely believe what he was doing was weighing several variables at the same time, uh, including the questions, the serious questions about his own constitutional authority. And it's all that, it's all that together. And so I, I'm somewhat hesitant to, uh, to uh, jump on a single bandwagon, even as important as that one was. Uh, well, if I'm if I'm wrong, I'm sure the other three will tell us in the next session. That's why I think that leads us into. I think we'll we'll go to a, a little a bit of a break, and we'll come back at three thirty with uh, the rest of our panelists to do the last session. And this will give people a chance uh, to ask questions of all of you. Um, if you didn't get your questions submitted uh, before now, I'm sending some on to Tom. But don't worry, you guys can still answer in the Q and A, and we'll we'll pass those along if you think of anything else. Uh, but uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna go back to our uh, break slide and we'll see you guys back here at 3.30. Well, it's 3.30, we're right on schedule. We appreciate the hardy ones who have stayed with us to the end. Uh, at this point in time, uh, Tom Taylor will reconvene with the panel of Dennis and Nicole and Amy, and uh, they will be more than ready and willing and able to answer questions that you would have. Some have been submitted previously, and some can be asked on the spot. So uh, I'll turn this over to Tom, our moderator, and um, he will lead the panel. At the end of the panel, we will Thank you again for being here and wish you goodbye and announce the next year's symposium. Thanks again so much. All right, one of the first questions we have um, <clears throat> uh, is put this way. If John Brown's actions led to a transformation, has that transformation been completed? Um, and the, the writer uh, adds, the CRT issue of today suggests it has not. So that's probably at least two questions, maybe three. And I shall duck all three and. Uh... Who, who wants to start? I mean, you're, I'll all be loaded for, you're all loaded for bear on this, so go ahead. <laughs> um, since the question did refer to John Brown, I'll just uh, start by saying that uh, the American Civil War certainly did bring freedom, but it did not bring equality. And the American Civil War did bring freedom, but it did not bring an end to racism. Um, Reconstruction was a, a period of hope that turned into a period of dismay. And America has had to deal with racism as a principal issue throughout our history, and we still are. Um, we continue to evolve and we continue to make effort, but um, the civil rights movement is, is prima facie evidence that 100 years after the Civil War, we did not have 
equality. And so um, John Brown was a transformation in one respect, um, in that he helped bring about an end to slavery, an end to enslavement. Uh, but freedom does not equate to equality. Uh, Amy, I think your sound isn't working. Okay, I, I gotta get, there go you on are. without me. <laughs> no, you're good. I gotta leave. I can turn off on the one, just a second. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I got this note that says my microphone's suddenly not working. Um, I'm getting feedback. So if you all wanna go ahead and talk, I'll try to figure this out. It's not bad, go ahead talk okay it's bad for me but all right <laughs> it sounds really odd um no i was just gonna chime in and sort of echo what dennis was saying and drawing that distinction between ending slavery and the pursuit of equality and i think lately i've been hearing in sort of the popular public conversation that you know slavery never really ended um you know and that it continues to persist today and I mean, as historians, we always kind of resist those kind of generalizations that miss the whole context <laughs> of what has changed over time. But I think it's really important um, on the one hand to you know, give credit to those who did end slavery and those who were enslaved did see that as an end. Um, so what John Brown was going for was achieved. Uh, at that point. And then the question really becomes, why didn't that translate into equality? And that raises all different sorts of questions um, about the later decades. So just wanted to add that. Nicole? Yeah, I would agree that um, you mentioned, Tom, turning points earlier that uh, Harper's Ferry and what John Brown did was, you know, one very eventful, uh, Im important moment on the movement towards the movement that we are still the process, we are still working out the historical process of trying to move towards uh, a multiracial society. And Eric Foner's great book on reconstruction says they created this biracial society in the South and it, it did not last. So I, I, I think, yes, what Brown did was transformative in a number of different ways, but if we're looking for this um, society where we live together in harmony, obviously we haven't reach that yet. And the whole debate over critical race theory, um, and particularly how anti-racism or the tenets of a multiracial society are taught to our, our children is still fraught with, with uh, conflict. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I, uh, all of us remember the movie Glory. And um, I'm fortunate enough to be very near Washington, D.C., and was invited to the, the premiere in Washington associated with the Smithsonian. And one of the uh, entities, uh, one of the living history groups that participated in the filming of Glory was Company B, 54th Massachusetts, which is a very, or used to be a very active uh, African-American living history group here in the Washington, D.C. area. And I knew a lot of these fellows because uh, they did a lot of work with us at Harper's Ferry National Historical Park, even before Glory came out. Um, we used to do United States Color Troop uh, presentations there, and, and Company B 54th Mass was our principal living history unit. So I went down to the premiere with the idea that uh, the theater would be packed. It was. Uh, the Washington Post had given it front page coverage. There was all this hype. 
And I remember walking into the theater and I was stunned. And what stunned me was there were virtually no African Americans in the audience. The company B 54th Mass was there, but out of several thousand people, there may have been a hundred African Americans. And it surprised me because at that time, Washington County, or Washington City was a majority black population city. And so uh, I was very surprised. It so happens that the um, regional director of the National Capital Region at that time, a great friend of mine, Robert Stanton, um, was African American himself. And Bob was there that night. And so uh, we got together some weeks afterwards and we had a chat about uh, the premier and glory. And, and Bob said to me, Bob Stanton, he said, Dennis, I was pretty surprised uh, that uh, we didn't have more African-Americans in the audience. Um, and it led to an interesting discussion. Um, Bob was trying to figure this out. I was trying to figure this out. Um, and Bob, Bob made a statement that I'll never forget. He said, you know, the Civil War was a beginning for us, but we still haven't seen the end. Uh, can we pick up on the la very last part of the question that was posed to us? Uh, but I'm going to put it in pretty broad terms, though. What, what do the three of you make of the current argument over CRT? Well, I think it's based on a lot of fear and misunderstanding. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what CRT is. Um, I mean, it's a certain thing that is often discussed in law schools and it has to do with understanding the way racism is embedded in the law. It's not anything that's taught in our elementary schools. It's not taught in our secondary schools. So there's a lot of misunderstanding mm -hmm. uh, behind it, but it, you know, clearly it stems from um, fear. It stems from fear about a lot of things and our, a lot of the questioning that we're doing during this racial reckoning and uh, what it means for those who have enjoyed a certain racial, racial privilege for a long time. Um, there's some fear about what will be lost. And I think that's sort of wrapped up in amplifying CRT into something bigger than it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with with Amy that uh, it's this very kind of arcane, specialized set of uh, principles that grew up in the law schools, um, and I, I think it's sort of become conflated with uh, what a lot of educators are trying to do, uh, which is. Um, you know, in, in my day when I was in school uh, during when the civil rights movement was going on and they were trying to make uh, these white kids in Southern Indiana understand uh, the problems of African-Americans in our society. Now we call this anti-racist teaching uh, and uh, the ed schools have very specialized curriculum about, about this. Um, and a lot of uh, parents react, maybe overreact um, with the, the sense that, uh, you know, that their kids are, are under attack or uh, being suggested that you are bad because uh, white people in the past did these, did these things. Um, it, it just seems to have become, uh, one of those issues that has just gotten very emotional and very overblown and maybe out of touch with the realities of what's actually going on. Uh, two thoughts. Uh, one is, um, when did Americans become afraid of controversy? What's, what's, why should we fear controversy? Controversy is reason for discussion. Uh, controversy is reason for exchange of, of thoughts and ideas. Uh, controversy is healthy. Uh, you know, none of us think the same way. 
all of us have a different point of view. That's being a human being. <laughs> Uh, earlier today, when I asked all of you to define John Brown in one word, you know, what you were sharing with me was your point of view. And so why should we take point of view out of education? Why should we not permit students to express themselves? I mean, what are we afraid of? Uh, what, why are we so fearful? Americans like to think we aren't afraid of anything. This is, this is puzzling. One other factor, and I think that uh, this isn't going to be a surprise to anyone, is that um, we certainly are in various cultural struggles. Uh, some like to refer to them as cultural wars. Um, but what's that all about? What's the basis for some of these things? And there's no question that, you know, as we look at demographic projections, as we look at demographic projections, about 20 years from now, um, white citizens, the, the, the Anglo-Saxon citizen in this country, uh, will become the majority minority. And that's, that's becoming a reality to people. And uh, I think that we can see so much of this uh, uh, extreme reaction that we're seeing is that people are fearful of becoming a future minority. If I can add to that, I think there's also a misunderstanding about what a lot of us as educators try to do, particularly at the college level, uh, that people seem to think we're in the business of indoctrination, in that if I have a student read a certain text, it's because I want them to believe that text. Um, and, and that's not necessarily the case. It may just be it's a good text for getting them to debate certain uh, issues. Um, and yeah, so I, so I think uh, that, there's, that there's this antagonistic sense that, that educators are trying to um, indoctrinate the students in a, in a party line, where, it, as Dennis says, we're introducing them to controversies in the past, some of which are still relevant to the present. Mm -hmm. I think some of this reflects um, sort of the, the belief and the recognition that history has power in our lives today. And so therefore it is something to fight over. Um, and I have to say, I've been teaching on the college level for you know 20 some years now. When I first started in like 2000-ish, you know, I had to kind of always make that case to students, you know, at that point in time that, you know, that this is meaningful and that, you know, it's connected and it's about who we are. And right now I do not have to make that case. I mean, it is like everybody's feeling it right now. So I don't know, as an educator, there's, there is some value to this moment too. Um, I'm not entirely afraid of it, <laughs> even if other people are, are fearful. <laughs> I'm going to change directions, but only slightly. I think what, another question that was has been posed to us asks about uh, parallels in the experience of black soldiers, in particular, in World War One and World War Two, and indeed you can make similar parallels. This person noted, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, regarding women in World War Two. Um, we, while the obviously the Civil War, World War, the two World Wars are quite different in all sorts of ways. There are similarities and struggles among black men trying to, you know, to be allowed uh, to fight, to be treated equally, to be treated with respect, which always seems remarkable in light of their service in the previous conflict. So, uh, are are we um, are are people wrong to see those parallels in those conflicts, uh, or is it just historians repeating themselves as the old joke goes? <laughs> No, I don't think they're wrong at all, uh, because as I mentioned this morning, I think African Americans viewed future wars, Spanish American War, World War I, World War II, uh, as opportunities. Some African Americans, I shouldn't say everybody, uh, viewed this as, as we're going to fight, um, we're going to do our part, and, and then we will get these rights that have been taken away from us reinstituted, or that will help with that. So you have in World War II, the double V, the idea in the African-American community of victory against uh, Japan and Germany, but victory against racism at home. And as I said, I think after, so I've seen a little bit 
uh, in my own research after World War I, World War II, you do see veterans becoming very involved and pushing for the return of certain rights uh, with more or less success. It takes, again, until we get into the 50s and 60s for the civil rights movement to, to really have substantive success. I think it's different for women because uh, the vote was achieved out of World War I. Um, and, and I would say um, Carrie Chapman Catt, for all her flaws, racism being one of them, uh, handled the moment of World War I much better than Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony did uh, the Civil War. Stanton and Anthony just assumed, hey, women are gonna get the vote along with men and we don't have to do anything extra. Cat uh, really poured herself into war work and making the argument that women are serving in World War I and should be rewarded with the vote. And that helped, helped uh, women to be successful in the final, the final suffrage uh, movement. So those are the comparisons I would make. Okay, another uh, another someone else is asking if 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 you folks could recommend some books that focus in particular on uh, black lives in the North before the Civil War. Uh, they they even ask are are there such books written by black authors that come to mind that you could recommend to them, and they ask something similar for the South after the Civil War, and we've got some really good social historians here, so. Well, the first one, I think, especially if you're asking about Black authors that we have to talk about is W.E.B. Du Bois' Black Reconstruction, um, just a classic about the Reconstruction period, although he begins in the war itself. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's a book that I keep coming back to and realizing, oh, Du Bois said this first. He got there first, <laughs> just when I think I have a new idea. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's really, that's a great place for anybody to start. Um, and another historian in, in Du Bois, of course, is writing around the turn of the 20th century. And another historian, George Washington Williams at that time is writing some really, another black historian, writing some really good work um, on, on, on the war and on African-American participation. So I'd recommend those. Yeah, if I can follow up on Du Bois, um, I, I feel like I have a personal relationship with Du Bois because of Harper's Ferry. Uh, you know, in 1906, in 1906, uh, Du Bois organized uh, a meeting at Harper's Ferry with leading African-American intellectuals from across the country. It was known as the Second Niagara Movement, and they met there in Harper's Ferry. In fact, they actually did a pilgrimage to the John Brown Fort, and uh, at the fort one morning, uh, took their shoes off, their socks off, and, and walked silently around the fort in honor of uh, Brown um, singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Um, but but what's really powerful, you mentioned that he, he there he was, he was first. He, he's already been there. He already did that for us. You know, King, uh, Martin Luther King was a great admirer of Du Bois. And uh, Du Bois delivered in 1906 at Harper's Ferry a civil rights talk, a plea for civil rights in 1906, 50 years before King really comes into the picture that could have applied to 1956, 1966. It was so current, so relevant, and it still lasts today. Every word that Du Bois issued in that powerful oration, and it was a short oration, uh, it, it would have been the equivalent of King's I Have a Dream speech in 1906. That's how powerful this oration is. But Du Bois had one great disadvantage compared to King. He didn't have television. <laughs> yeah, just to, to add to Du Bois and um, these suggestions, um, a couple thoughts. Um, Juliet Walker has a book called Free Frank, which I believe is, is she's a descendant of Free Frank, who was uh, enslaved in Kentucky, got his freedom, moved into Illinois in the 1830s and became a town founder and a founder of an African-American you know, free free black town in, in Illinois. So that, that's a kind of interesting um, book. Uh, the other person who came to mind is Thavolia Glimpf, who's written not just about African-American women, but about women in the Civil War. Um, 
And one of my old professors, Richard Blackett, uh, has written a book about um, fugitive slave, the, when Dennis was talking about the Fugitive Slave Act um, and uh, people who, who were fleeing in, enslavement. Um, and then and the other suggestion that comes to mind is um, Henry Louis Gates. It's not a book, but Henry Louis Gates did a PBS documentary on Reconstruction um, that features a lot of young African-American authors. Um, so if you, you watch that and listen to people talking about, um, the, the, this would be the post-Civil War period, uh, but I think that would introduce you to a lot of, of bright um, Civil War era scholars whose work you might want to read. Um, another questioner uh, noted that there's a fair amount of overlap among the four presentations, which is undoubtedly true. Um, and and the, the question is, uh, so what do the four of us think the takeaways are today? <laughs> I don't like being the student when they ask me questions. <laughs> do we see takeaways from all this? Well, the lost cause view of the war has been put to bed. <laughs> it's been destroyed. I mean, I think we're all working in a, a, a vein and an interpretation that's very much, you know, late 20th early 21st century, you know, I mean, all of us dealing with slavery and even acknowledging um, its position in this war, I mean, certainly reflects our times. You know, let me talk about the National Park Service for a moment uh, with regard to that. Um, the NP Harper's Ferry, we never had any issue talking about the issue of slavery. Uh, it was one reason we were so significant in American history. Uh, but I know a lot of the battlefield parks where I have many, many friends working over the years struggled with the discussion of slavery. They didn't believe the, the enabling legislation, for example, the congressional enabling legislation that created the National Park or the National Military Battlefield uh, almost never mentioned slavery. In the, in the congressional legislation. Now, remember, this legislation was passed in the 1890s, 1920s, and the 1930s. And so uh, the whole idea of, of, uh, uh, <laughs> of the lost cause was paramount in, when these, these legislations were passed. Um, so, so many people would come back when, the, when the various leaders or officials in the Park Service would say, you know, we really should talk about the cause of the war. And then people in the national parks, National Park Service representatives would say, well, we can't talk about slavery. That's not in our enabling legislation. That's not why we were created. I mean, I lived through these debates. I was horrified to hear fellow historians in the National Park Service make comments like that. But it was it was a, an entrenchment into the actual congressional authorization as an excuse not to talk about this very controversial issue. Now, the Park Service has gotten over that, it, but it took it took 30 years, 30 years of evolution and people retiring and people dying and people transferring out of these various uh, military parks to finally begin that process of uh, speaking about the war in terms of its cause is, no debate, slavery. Well, I think um, we've arrived at a point as some of the questions today indicated where uh, we've talked a lot about the variety of African-American experience and um, you know Amy with her work on the on the contraband camps and people saying well, I never even heard about that um, so there's we're, we're now at this period where we're bringing forward a lot of information about the African-American experience of the war that had just kind of in the old lost cause days been erased um, and that, that movies like Glory helped to, to make people aware of, of the soldiers. And now we're fighting with the balance uh, because I think today we had Dennis talking about John Brown and Tom, you talked about um, a lot about Lincoln and his development towards the Emancipation Proclamation. So half of the panels have been about sort of 
um, the white allies, shall we say, and Amy and I have looked more at you know, what's happening to African-Americans during and after the war. Um, but that's the, the balance, the question we, that uh, came up earlier about Brown's statue being so much larger than the African-American figure that he, he's with. Um, so I, I think we're working out, you know, how much of the story still needs to be about people like Lincoln. And I think Lincoln and Brown, the story doesn't make sense unless they are in it. Uh, but we need that story. And we also need these other stories that in the old uh, traditional days were, were erased. The three of you are in a lot of conferences and, and panels and discussions, et cetera, uh, uh, and more than I am, especially when it comes to the Civil War. Are we living in an era in which, what I'll just br broadly call it the social history of the war era, is now going through the same kind of revolution and insights that maybe the military history went through decades ago? Don't tell me the answer is no, because I'm thinking what you're doing is really important. Don't disappoint me. Well, I, I think um, that there are people who are doing military history who are doing uh, very interesting things. And, you know, we've recently had um, articles uh, suggesting that the number of, of uh, dead soldiers is even, even larger than we already mm -hmm. knew that it was. Um, and uh, rethinking of certain of uh, the battles. So um, I, I really feel like Civil War history is flourishing on any number of, of different kinds of fronts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, one thing we're seeing right now is as so many social historians are doing Civil War history and you know, social history is all about looking at the contributions, the agency of, you know, ordinary people. I mean, just like what I talked about today. Um, but there's also kind of a, let's make sure and not romanticize this and make it too triumphant a history because a lot of these ordinary people, whether they're black or white or male or female, um, we're living through a really deadly destructive war and, you know, the illnesses, the disease and the the death. And so there's a lot of sort of acknowledgement of just um, what a terrible war this was. You know, some people call this like a dark turn in Civil War mm -hmm. studies, which, you know, I don't know about that term, but um, there's a lot of, of work on just, you know, what a horrible war this was. Um, some people see this as a reaction to Ken Burns' film that they feel kind of, you know, with much emphasis on sort of the triumph and how, you know, good um this war was and what it resulted but you know it was it was a really hard thing to live through so that's that's been an emphasis of some historians these days you know uh, again I, I feel so blessed that i was able to spend a career at harper's ferry national historical park i i grew up very close to harper's ferry i've been a native i've lived here all my life uh, harper's ferry is in my genes um, and so it's, it's part of me. And so Harper's Ferry never had that uh, struggle between military history and social history. We have both, and they are of equal importance, and we tried to present them uh, equally. One of my favorite things was uh, I would take people out to the Potomac River. And most of you have been to the point where the Shenandoah and Potomac come together, and it's, it's a glorious scene. It is gorgeous. It's one of the prettiest sites in the eastern United States. And so we would stand there for a moment and, and my audience would, would just stand there quietly because it's, it's all inspiring. You don't talk when you see such beauty, such serenity. It speaks to you. You don't have to speak to it. And when after a few moments of silence, um, I would speak up and I would say, enjoy it now because they didn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And of course, this arouses a curiosity. Well, who is they? And I would speak about, I would, I would point across the Potomac to the cliffs over in Maryland, which overlooked the Potomac there. 
And I would say, well, you see those cliffs, those cliffs are the United States of America. And I would get this incredibly puzzled look on people's faces. Well, of course it's the United States of America, Ranger. I mean, where's your head? Of course it's the United States. And then I would say, where you're standing is not. You're not in the United States. This is not the United States, effective April 18, 1861. You're in a new nation. You're in a foreign country. It's called the Confederate States of America. And it was the perfect blending of military history and social history because I then would finish this discourse by pointing to the Potomac River and saying, this is an international boundary. And there was no peace on this boundary for four years. I believe they want us to wrap up at four o'clock. I'm going to ask you one more question that somebody has posed. Was that awful war necessary to end slavery? Well, I think this is where John Brown was prophetic and Dennis probably quoted from Hart, but his, um, his brief message when he goes to the gallows and he says he always believed that slavery would be ended with blood. He just had not heretofore realized with how much blood it would be done. And he turned out to be right. And I would close with uh, the point that I think William Freeling made, which that we should think about the fact that the United States was the only new world slave nation that needed a bloody civil war to end uh, slavery, unless you include um, the Haitian rebellion. Uh, but uh, the British ended slavery in the West Indies, Brazil, ended slavery in the late 1800s. Uh, we had this internecine conflict. And what does that say about the United States? You know, uh, in 1861, we really were two countries. Um, the South, the North, culturally, had become so extremely divided, economically it, uh, very divided. Now, now, Northerners don't like to admit that slavery, they were very dependent upon slavery <laughs> for economic benefit in much of the North, especially in New England. But uh, we, we, the idea that, um, that we could somehow continue to compromise and continue to debate this and, and continue to, uh, um, as, as Lincoln would say, you know, can we, can we survive um, half free and half slave? Um, so Lincoln himself was prophetic, as, as was Brown. Um, I don't know that the war would have come in 1861. But what definitely brought it on was the election of a Republican. And I don't mean that has nothing to do with Republicans today. Nothing. That has everything to do with the fact that for the first time, the South did not control the White House. Even if we had people from the North in the White House in previous years, Southerners still controlled them. We, we historians like to refer to them as no face presidents. South had control of the executive branch. For the first time, it didn't in the 1860 election. And that was too much. Uh, they felt they had lost control of the, of the Congress. Certainly in the House of Representatives, they lost control. They did not have political power there. They did not have a voice there, they felt. In the Senate, every state that was added, they, they, we, they tried to maintain balance. It was getting harder and harder to do. Uh, that, was the, that, that was the filibuster in the Senate, was the balance between northern states and southern states. That was always going to be the filibuster of that period. They, were, they knew, they saw what was happening. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, with a Republican in, in the White House and a Republican Congress, they became quite 
concerned about the majorities and what might happen with the court. So Southerners believe, the Southern oligarchy, the Southern slave oligarchy believed that they had no recourse, that they had lost power in the current existing government of the United States. And when you lose power, you become desperate. And, and you, in that case, they were so desperate um, and so unwilling to remain in the Union that they decided to create their own nation. Um, so I don't know if it was eventual, but there's one thing for certain. You lose political power, power that you've had ever since the country's been in existence. That's gone. You may become extreme. Nicole, you want the last word? Um, Amy, I have I'm my so, say, I, Amy. I'm yeah. sorry, Amy. Sorry. Yeah, but I'm looking at Amy and saying Nicole. But when you put it that way, then I feel like it's got to be profound. And, and I'm not sure <laughs> I have anything profound to say because I think Nicole and Dennis really um, put it really well. Um, you know, there was a story that used to be told or, or it was kind of a, an interpretation out there that, oh, the South would have ended slavery on its own. You know, that it was already kind of like, you know, sort of on the, the way out, you know, that the, the, you know, the Union the U.S. didn't have to put up this fight and la, la, la. But for all the reasons you said, plus the fact that, you know, if you go back and you look at some of the things these Southerners are doing in the 1850s, like trying to expand territorially into Central and South America in order to expand their cotton empire, um, they were not going to do this on their own. Um, so, you know, for that reason, uh, a war, a war was necessary. Um, sad, but true. Well, on that happy note, thank you all <laughs> very much. And Ski, we're turning it back over to you. Thank you, Tom, for moderating. Well, according to all these little buttons I've been pushing, my video has started and the sound is on, so I have to trust that that indeed is the case. Uh, words cannot express um, how much I appreciate Dennis and Nicole and Amy and Tom for spending their day with us. Uh, we had high expectations coming into this day, and you all have far, far, far exceeded those expectations. And we're ever so grateful for your time and your energy, your ability to teach us and to make it understandable. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience for those of us who were uh, attendees. Uh, March the 4th, 2023 will be our next symposium. Yes, yeah, a year away, but we've already begun. Uh, we have four speakers have been confirmed already, and that's what we will hold to. Uh, we're gonna change a little bit from where we were this time, and we're gonna go back to a little bit of military history next time, and we're gonna focus on uh, the borough of Gettysburg. And um, we have a husband and wife team coming to speak with us, uh, Scott Hartwick and his wife, um, Judge, Frank Williams is uh, like our grandfather. Uh, he uh, says, when am I coming back? I'm coming next year. Uh, here's what I'm talking about. And if you know Frank, um, you say, yes, sir. Uh, I do not argue or debate with him, even though I have. And uh, I've denied him on occasion, but it's awful hard to say no to him. And then our own Tom Stafford, who is our extraordinary writer in our community. He interviewed uh, Dennis on the, over the telephone and wrote a nice article about that. And that was in our paper a couple weeks ago. Uh, Tom is gonna present something he's always wanted to do. And he wanted to be a speaker here in our symposium. And he's gonna talk about the Gettysburg Address. So that's our lineup for next year. We, we are so thankful and we're planning to be in person. Um, we were going to be in person this year, but when we made the decision, it was the end of November, early December, and the numbers were raging, and we decided no. Today, Springfield's headline, as I mentioned earlier, perhaps, is that we have dropped 90% of the numbers in Clark County, which is our county. So, Lord willing, uh, we'll be back next year on March the 4th in person, and uh, we will uh, see you all then. We thank you ever so much again for spending a good day with us. Thanks again. Goodbye.
Thanks for having us. Thanks, Steve. Thank, thank you, Ski. Oh, thank you all. It's more than we could, words can say. It's been good. Thank you.